Happy New Year and welcome to the British Library. This is our first event of 2024. I'm Bee Rollout of the Cultural Events team and tonight we're celebrating the life, the work and the significant friendships of Wilkie Collins, the hugely influential author of the original detective novel on his 200th birthday. Now, I have to let you know that you will not find a better informed panel of Wilkieites if I may, I'm not sure what the collective noun is, maybe you can find out, anywhere on earth. So please, audience, have your questions ready. Um, if you look at the screen right below, there's a box where you can pop your question in at any time. And there'll be time, just dedicated time for our panel to address those questions. So don't hold back. We love to get feedback on events. And um, there's also a donate button for the British Library, should you feel inclined. Um, I'm delighted, though, to introduce our chair for tonight. He'll be leading the conversation. It's Paul Lewis, who's co-editor of the Collected Let Letters of Wilkie Collins. Um, he writes and lectures on Wilkie Collins, most recently the author of Wilkie and Money in Wilkie Collins in Context, which came out in 2023. Um, Paul is also the secretary of the Wilkie Collins Society, and there's a link to that also on the platform you can see. And if you're also thinking, is it that Paul Lewis? Well, yes, he's also the award-winning presenter of the BBC's Moneybox programme. And on a side note, um, he's got a book out on that subject too. It's called Moneybox, your toolkit for balancing your budget, growing your ba bank balance and living a better financial life. Who doesn't want to do that? Bit of a side note there, but I'm sure you'll forgive me. We love selling books here at the British Library. Anyway, without further ado, it's time to get back to the birthday celebration. So it's my great pleasure to hand over to you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you very much, B, for that long, long introduction and indeed promotion. Um, well, with me today, I'm delighted to say, is Andrew Lysett, who has written biographies of Wilkie Collins, Arthur Conan Doyle, Dylan Thomas and Ian Fleming. At one time, he wrote a book on Colonel Gaddafi, I believe. His most recent work, though, is The World of Sherlock Holmes. I did ask him if this was a biography of Sherlock Holmes, and he said, but Paul, he wasn't a real man. Um, that it puts Conan Doyle and his creation in the context of the 19th century. And he lives not far from where Wilkie Collins' lifelong homes were in Marylebone. And our second panellist is Caroline Radcliffe. She's a reader in drama and performance at the University of Birmingham. She's written very widely on 19th century theatre and cultural history. And recent publications include, I must mention, two scholarly editions of dramas by Wilkie Collins. One was The Lighthouse and the other The Red File, both published by the Wilkie Collins Society. And uh, as B kindly said, there's a link to the society uh, on the, the, the page you can see and you can join there as well. And Caroline's currently completing a book for, for Routledge on Collins dramas. So what could be more appropriate? Uh, let's start with, with, with the man, though. Who was Wilkie Collins? Andrew Lysett, where did he come from to burst onto the literary scene in the 1850s? Well, can you hear me OK? Because I just saw I, I lost the link there, but you can hear me OK, yeah? Yes. Yeah, OK. All right. Um, Wilkie uh, was the son of uh, an artist, um, a royal academician, uh, who lived most of his life in a very sort of small um, area of London, North London, in Marylebone. His, that was where his parents had lived. His, I think it's his grandfather had lived there before, um, in New Cavendish Street, where he was born on this day uh, in 1824. Um, so who was Wilkie Collins? Um, he, he became one of the, the most beloved of English novelists in the 19th century. He died in 1889. So he sort of straddled the Victorian era. And he addressed himself to sort of a lot of the issues of um, an expanding society where uh, people were finding out about new things and et cetera. Um, and in particular, he became he, well known as the, the father of the sensation novel. Um, this was a genre of novels where, uh, well, he was the father of the detective novel <laughs> as well. It was part of a genre uh, known as the, the sensation novelists. And um, basically, they sort of wanted to 
uh, leave behind some of the the kind of strictures of earlier genre um, uh, in novels. So there was the sort of Gothic tradition and the, the Silver Fork tradition of the early 19th century. Um, Wilkie wanted to address issues of this modern expanding Victorian society uh, where um, people were sort of finding out about um, the world around them. But um, basically what he was um, addressing was the kind of problems that people have with uh, their um, emotions in society. Now, Paul, you probably know a, a bit about this. Can you just help me a bit with it? Because I just... Uh, just and just tell us a bit more about um, his family briefly. Do you want a bit more on that? His father was an artist, a very famous artist at the time. His brother was also an artist. And we now know from things that have been found in auctions quite recently that Wilkie was a competent artist himself. Did his art affect his work? I'm, sorry, I'm not hearing you very well. Did, did Wilkie's artist, artistic background affect his work? Do we see things about art, about um, the, the way that things look in, in his work? Indeed. And, you know, he addressed um, in in his novels uh, um, issues of um, arts and um, he, he, yes. I think, Andrew, I mean, sorry, I, I, I can't give you... You're breaking up very moment, slightly. But, um, um, Caroline Radcliffe, we've talked about Wilkins' novels, and he is known principally as a novelist. If you are, if people have heard of him, they say, oh, he wrote The Woman in White and the Moonstone, didn't he? Um, but you're interested in his plays, and from an early age, he was into acting and writing plays. What got you interested in that slightly more unusual aspect of Wilkie Collins? Well, it's... it's really nice to be back at the British Library because this is where it all started. Um, so I was working as a research assistant for the Buried Treasures Lord Chamberlain Plays Collection project, which was jointly run by the British Library in Rolf Holloway, where I did my PhD. And my job was in the manuscripts collection, and I had to catalogue about 1,200 plays, which involved reading them all. So you can imagine I was kind of ploughing through 10 to 12 plays a day, and suddenly this play literally leapt off the page, and it was The Red Vial by Wilkie Collins. And I'd already been a great fan of Wilkie Collins from the age of about 16 or 17 when a friend had handed me The Woman in White and I'd been absolutely passionate about his novels. So when I saw that there was this play, I was really confused because I, I as, as a theatre historian, had no awareness that he had written plays. Um, the Red Vial really stood out for its theatricality. And um, unlike a lot of the copies that are in the Lord Chamberlain play collection, it had quite detailed um, stage directions. So here was somebody who really understood the theatre. Um, he had an awareness of lighting. He had a, a real awareness of mise-en-scene, where, where he wanted um, all the scenery to be situated. It's, you know, this, this was a, a kind of novelist um mind working in detail um and the other thing that stood out about the red vial was that it had the most macabre scene in the third act and i literally felt the hair stand up on my neck as i read it yep. so that was my introduction you say that, and that's really fascinating because, of course, it wasn't his most successful play, was it? It was taken off very quickly. He did have much more successful plays later. But tell us a bit about another early play, The Lighthouse, which you've also worked on. Yes. Well, The Lighthouse is the other manuscript that the British Library holds for his plays, as well as a version of The New Magdalene and Miss Gwilt. Um, they've also got quite a lot of the printed kind of proof 
copies of other plays, um, but these are the kind of um, really important manuscripts. Um, but The Lighthouse was, was in 1855. It was his first um, attempt at writing an original drama. And um, by this time, he was working with Charles Dickens in his amateur th theatricals. He'd already um, appeared in a number of plays with Dickens. Um, and so their friendship was really cemented through drama. He'd been introduced to Dickens by Augusta Segg, who was one of the painters from the clique um, which, which was a, a, a kind of painting brotherhood similar to the pre-Raphaelites, but actually in opposition. Um, and, and the lighthouse, again, it's, it contains very Gothic elements like the red file. But actually what he's trying to do, and this is what people haven't really thought about, is, is that he was really breaking boundaries in terms of 19th century theatre because he was really seeking a psychological um, way of writing and a psychological way of acting. Um, and in fact, people compared him to Emil Zola, who was the great proponent of dramatic naturalism in the 1870s. But, but my claim in my book is that Wilkie actually got there first. And the reason people didn't like the Red Vial was that he was working within a, a, a sort of sensational realism. Let's come on to his sensation fiction, and we'll come back to Dickens and Collins a little bit later, I hope. But Andrew Lysett, people know Collins through The Woman in White, written 1859, 1860. Why was The Woman in White so popular? It, it trebled the circulation of the periodical it appeared in, didn't it, and became his most famous work, and the one he wanted on his gravestone. Well, yeah, I mean, can, can I... I just go back a little bit and talk about how Wilkie sort of got into this because um, you know, he came as you from an artistic family. Um, his father was an artist. His mother came from an artistic family as well. And when he um, he started writing, uh, he, he was sort of geared to be going into the tea business, but he decided that um, he wanted to be, a, to be a writer. So, you know, he started writing um, and initially he started um, writing for Dickens's periodical um, uh, and... Um, Household Words initially. What? Household Words initially. Household Words, yeah. After, all the year round came, came later, yeah. Uh, and he started writing articles about things that were going on in the world and arti writing articles about um, his experiences of being a writer. Uh, and he was very much a man of his, his world. Um, he wanted to represent it. He wanted to represent how the um, life was changing in Victorian times. So he wanted earlier novels had been about, um, as I've said earlier, sort of gothic themes. He wanted to bring the sensational themes into the house. He wanted to bring them home uh, to, into people's lives. Um, so one of his first uh, sensation novels, although it wasn't actually termed it that as, as such at the time, was um, Basil, um, which um, is described fittingly as a story of modern life. And it's about um, this, this person who has a fixation on a woman that he, he sees in um, an omnibus. And he basically, he stalks her. Um, it's a sort of very modern story really. And um, he wants, decides he wants to marry her, but he is, um, Sort of prevented to, uh, from doing that by his father, and who um, says that he must wait until he is uh, she is eighteen years old. There's often in Wilkie Collins's stories and later his novels um, a, a strange discrepancy between ages, and that you know there's an older man uh, 
with a, a younger woman. And that was actually Wilkie's experience in his own life. He had friends who had exactly that, um, that experience. One of his early uh, experiences uh, as a young man was um, work, um, uh, acting, providing a sort of, as acting as the usher, act, acting as the facilitator for the wedding between a friend of his, the um, uh, an artist, um, Ned Ward, uh, and a much younger woman uh, who, you know, was not yet ready to, to be married, not he yet. Was 15, not wasn't yet she? Changed. Hmm? He was 15 at the time. 15, that's right. And Wilkie helped uh, facilitate that marriage. She got a special license for the marriage. Um, and that sort of theme props up in, in his life, in his novels, where he is writing about um, uh, men who uh, have younger women. Somehow they're, they're not supposed to be, um, you know, according to the law of the land, they're not supposed to be uh, getting married or they're not supposed to be stitched or they, they sh you know, they shouldn't be divorced or they can't get divorced. This is the sort of subject that he's trying to uh, um, focus on. Yes. And, um, so and, and in I mean, Basil, I feel... this story, I mean, you want to talk about the, the woman in white, right? No, no, please talk about Basil. I wanted to mention that what I think is the most extraordinary scene in Victorian literature, where he, he suspects that this young woman is being unfaithful to him with someone who works for her father, and he follows them to a hotel takes the room next door and Wilkie says, I believe, Wilkie writes, um, I heard all, I knew all. He knew that they were making love in the room next door. It's the most extraordinary scene for a novel written in the in the yeah. early 1850s. I think, I think it's worth mentioning here that these sort of things never happen in the dramas. And that was because of the Lord Chamberlain's very, very strict licensing laws. So he knew that that this the sort of scene that you're describing would not make it past the censors. Um, so the the what we might call adaptations, which he actually never called adapt adaptations, he called them alterations, um, were very, very different to the original novels. And I think part of it was because he 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 knew they they would be censored. For instance, in the Moonstone, um, the thief Rosanna um, Spearman, who who had had a history as a thief, wasn't in it. In Man and Wife, Esther Detheridge wasn't in it. She was also somebody of ill repute. You know, he he removed all the characters that might be too controversial. And yet, when he dramatised Armadale, his longest book, and the one he said to at least two correspondents was his favourite, when he dramatised that, it was the anti-heroine, Miss Gwilt, Lydia Gwilt, who was possibly an adulterer and a murderer, who became the title of the play and was the main character in it. So yes. he got that past the Lord Chamberlain. But but again, those overt references which are in the novel, which which refer to her sort of previous career and career as uh, you know, childhood previous life back, yeah. uh, a performer. Um they they uh, he didn't reference, he couldn't have done, it wouldn't have got through. And he writes about how he knows that some of this sensational material, where it, it, he knows it can't work. Um, the same with Madeline Vanstone in No Name. Yes, No Name. And of course, the, the new Magdalene, which was his most popular play, it was performed all over America and over a, many, many times in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and that, of course, also had a theme, didn't it? Of uh, yes, of... and by by that time, drama drama was moving towards the social play. Yes. So, so again, I I look at him as being really progressive and really radical in the sort of themes that he was was um, using dramatically. Um, and and of course he was criticised by Swinburne for for um, you know for taking a social stand, 
Um, but, but this was anticipating writers like Pinero and Shaw. And Pinero was very influenced by him. He acted in some of Collins's dramas. He um, did sort of take up social causes later in his life in a sort of more political sense, if you like. But early on, he was very sort of concerned about uh, you know, writing his stories and plotting his stories. And um, you know, in, in Basil, just to go back to that, you know, there is, I mean, Paul mentioned this extraordinary scene where um, he sort of overhears um, his girlfriend and Robert Mannion, um, the sort of anti-hero of the, the story, um, making love. But also there's a, you know, the subsequent is a, a very kind of violent scene where um, Basil attacks Mannion and um, basically maims him. And it then, you know, in a typical sort of Wilkie way, uh, the sort of backstory emerges and Mannion, um, it's, um, it's uh, turns out was, is the, 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 um, the son of a forger. Uh, who was once patronized um, by Basil's father. And um, uh, it's um, the, um, I, I somehow, uh, can, can you just help me there, Paul? What, what happens there? What, what? Oh, well, well, the father wouldn't, uh, di didn't want him to marry didn't want Basil to marry his daughter. Mannion seemed to be a better option, but he did have a, a fight with him and he did maim him. Um, but he lived, he did live happily eventually, as I recall in, in the latter part of that book. But let, may, I, may I go back to his friendship with Dickens because this is very, a key, an important part of his life, an important part of Dickens' life. And sometimes people see Wilkie Collins as perhaps a, a kind of acolyte of Dickens, someone who who was a worship Dickens. None of that was true. Um, and, and Caroline, how did they compare as dramatists? Because Wilkie once said he'd have been a dramatist if dramatists were paid as well in England as they were in France. He preferred writing plays to novels, but of course he wrote novels to make his money, which he did very successfully. But how was he as a dramatist compared with Dickens, who liked to think he could actually improve Wilkie Collins' plays when they worked together? I think actually when you look at Dickens' place and Collins' place together, Collins is definitely the, the one who's the radical, definitely the one who's trying to push the boundaries of drama. Dickens was trying to do this through acting. Dickens was by far the better actor. Um, uh, Collins's mother seems to be his greatest fan when it came to acting. And <laughs> I think other people were rather of the same opinion that he he was a bit overshadowed by Dickens' immense charisma and well, his talent. acting career sort of started at home, didn't it? I mean, yes. he would put on these plays in um, uh, how did he describe it? The the Theatre the Royal room. back drawing room, he says. The Theatre yes. Royal yeah. back drawing room. Um, and, and in fact, so... his parents met through the theatre. They they met, um, they, the, you know, through a, a part of it was a shared love of theatre. They went to a, a Charles Matthews performance and that's where yep. um, they, they kind of but cemented also, their relationship. Also, um, uh, Wilkie sort of first came to... Um, into Dickens's uh, environment through the theatre, didn't he? And I mean, he was, uh, Dickens yeah, invited um, him to take a small part in not so yeah, bad as we see a Bull uh, Willitton play, which Dickens wanted to use to raise money for hard up actors and, and artists. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, was, it, it uh, toured the country and raised four thousand pounds, a lot of money then. I mean, paradoxically. Dickens seems to be more conservative in his taste. He preferred things like Goldsmith and, um, you know, The Rivals. And they they were the sort of plays that, that he, he was writing on a, a kind of um, late 18th century model. But, but um, Wilkie was really taking the form forward. And that's that's actually partially responsible for the perception that his plays weren't good. But, but actually a lot of them achieved huge success and he was really considered as a dramatist as well as a novelist. 
yes, he, he he certainly made quite a lot of money. I mean, the woman in white made him nearly five hundred pounds, which you know multiply by at least a hundred to get today's values. The new Magdalene made him. 650 and even the moonstone which wasn't the greatest of his place caroline was it made him 340 odd pounds let, let me move us on though because you can't talk about wilkie collins without talking about his two houses his two lovers his two names and you know between them his four children so he had this parallel life andrew yeah uh, I mean, it was his life, basically. He, um, uh, he was living, as I mentioned, in Marylebone. Uh, I see you sort of making exc exclamations there. I don't know what they are. Uh, anyway, um, so um, he, in his early early part of his his um, his his career, basically, he was living in in um, impoverished circumstances in Marylebone. He was just. He had been living with his mother. He just moved out into a place um, which he wrote about um, in um, in Marylebone, and he he wrote about uh, the he'd just been on a um, holiday in Paris. He liked to to go off to Paris. I can't remember whether this was one that he went on with Dickens. I think probably not. But he'd been in Paris and. He lived in quite sort of plush circumstances there, and he came back to live in um, really reduced circumstances in, I think it was Howland Street in Marylebone. And um, just down the road was this woman called Caroline Graves, uh, who was living with her mother, Marianne, and her daughter. Now, Marianne, um, Caroline Graves was a widow. She had been married, but her husband had died. Um, and she was very much in reduced circumstances as well. But she was trying to sort of lift herself up because um, she, her real name was actually Elizabeth, um, a, an army officer, a gentleman, but in fact, he was a carpenter. Um, but um, so she was sort of looking to make her way in um in in her life but she was living uh in basically what her, her mother was running what um would perhaps be described as a sort of junk shop or something like that uh but she sort of met wilkie collins um now there was wilkie was a uh had um, a lot of friends in the in the sort of artistic community and um one of them was um, the artist Millet, uh, whose son, um, John Gilles Millet, wrote uh, a biography of his father, in which he um, posited, he put forward a thesis that uh, Wilkie's first meeting with uh, Caroline Graves, uh, probably somewhere around um, Mount Marylebone, perhaps in um, Regent's Park, uh, was um, based on um, based, um, a result uh, f from, um, I've lost the thread, my thread there, so um, basically... Yeah, I mean, the um, story was that, that she was seen coming screaming out of a villa in Regent's Park, wasn't it, when they were walking home with Millet, and... She, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And he rescued her, at least he claimed he rescued her, though he did not reappear until the morning. And after that, they were together. But it is, as you say, more likely that he just met her as he walked past, perhaps on that walk in 1853 or 54. Um, and they began living together um, and they lived together. That is absolutely um, right. But, but I mean, you know, that that idea of... Um, uh, Caroline Graves being the um, the model for for uh, the woman in white is discredited. I mean, it you know it's not considered actually a absolutely. And tell us about his second lover because a few okay, let's get maybe on to ten her. years okay. after meeting Caroline. Um, so uh, Wilkie had met Caroline Graves, I think, in the mid eighteen fifties. Does that tally with you? Yes. yes. Um, and um, uh, 
he lived with her in Marylebone and they, they moved in, moved to different houses in Marylebone, always in Marylebone. Um, and then uh, after um, uh, The Woman in White, um, he was, you know, he went on to write um, a couple more so-called um, sensation novels. Uh, there was No Name, and then there was Armadale. And um, in researching Armadale, uh, Wilkie went with a friend to Norfolk, and uh, he alighted upon a, a attractive young woman, uh, still, I think, only sort of mid-teenage, uh, behind the bar in um, uh, a pub in Great Yarmouth. Uh, she was a local girl, um, came from an agricultural family, um, little education or anything like that, but they struck up a relationship. And somehow or other, the details are not absolutely clear, uh, Wilkie prevailed on her to come and live um, in London, close to him, in Marylebone. Now, you know, at the same time, he was living with Caroline Graves, and her daughter, uh, and um, he moved his girlfriend, um, Martha Rudd, into a house li literally a, a sort of a, a mile away. Um, and after a while, um, various things happened. Um, uh, Caroline Graves got tired of this situation and moved out. She said no, she wasn't going to have any more of this arrangement. So she uh, in 1868, which was actually the 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 um, uh, the year of the publication of the Moonstone, um, she moved out and got married unexpectedly to a young guy. She was then in her mid thirties, and he was in his early twenties. Um, a sort of uh, and. And after she moved out um, and, and married, married sort of a, a quite a wealthy wine uh, for three years. And then she came back um, to live with Wilkie. She came back. By then, Wilkie was quite established with, um, with Martha. And uh, soon after that, he began to have the first of his uh, three children with, with Martha. Uh, yeah. And... Um, uh, and Andrew, you, you found out about this man, Joseph Clough, because uh, pretty soon after they married, it seems, you found him on a, uh, the list on the list of, of passengers on a boat to Australia. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was just one of those things that a biographer <laughs> discovers. And it's always fun to to discover that kind of thing. But, you know, basically it, I, it meant that their relationship, this very unequal relationship hadn't worked out, this this relationship that. Um, you know, in another uh, sort of situation, Wilkie would have written about himself. So, yeah. you know, it was very much the sort of situation that, you know, he would have he would have liked to have written about. And it wasn't just two households, was it? Because when he was with Martha, he and she took a different name. Yes. Um, Wilkie had trained as a, uh, well, trained, yes, I suppose that is the right word. But he'd, he'd certainly... Um, in sort of seeking a career as a writer, I mentioned that he worked as a tea broker, but he'd also um, he'd also been uh, a barrister. And he, you know, he trained as as a barrister at um, I think it was Lincoln's Inn. Um, so um, he, sorry, what what, what, were, well, what were you asking? He invented again, a new pers persona for himself, didn't he, and called himself. Oh yeah. So he, William he, he, Dawson, he, he just, barrister. He, he, of, so when he came he, um, to visits to Martha overnight, which led to them having two children in Bolsover Street, um, he was Mr. Dawson, and she that's was right. Mrs. Mr. Dawson was a, was a lawyer. Which was true. Um, so he had these two families and these two names and these two personas. And Caroline, can I ask you about this idea of of sort of I suppose otherness is a, is a word, isn't it? But people not being quite what they seem in his plays. Did he use that theme in his plays as he did in his books and indeed in his life? I think it's more in the novels that you find that because um, 
again, you know, I see him as really pushing boundaries of 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 what we perceive as normal. And he says in the introduction to Basil, he says, um, you know, I'm not here to write about the everyday. We we can we can all write about that. I'm here to write about the extraordinary. You, you know what? And these things do happen in our lives, and and we come across these situations and these people. So he he writes in a lot of. Um, Women who don't conform neatly to gender expectations. You know, you cited Miss Gwilt, Lydia Gwilt, as an example. I mean, I I love Lydia Gwilt because she, um, you know, she's a, a woman who finds ways around things. You know, she's not, she's a survivor. She's a very, a, t a tough woman, even though she, she, well, I won't make a spoiler, but she ends up badly, doesn't she? But... <laughs> Um, but, she you starts know, Madeline, off badly as well in the book, but she also ends up badly, I think. Yeah, but in, in no name as well. You know, it's a woman who won't be put down by circumstances. She's a fighter. So um, you get Marion Halcom in The Woman in White, who's who's a very masculine woman, um, but, but a woman who clearly the writer admires and who Fosco admires. Um, Oscar but being also, the villain in the woman in yes, white. Yes, you also get disabled characters who, um, you know, again, they're 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 kind of pushing against these notions of of disability, really. Um, so so he he kind of tests all of those boundaries, um, and also, of course, he writes about race. Um, and a lot of people have written about this, about how, you know, like Dickens, he 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 wasn't always, um, you know, he can be criticised for his racial views in the way that most Victorians can. But actually, compared to Dickens, he was really progressive, um, particularly in the Moonstone, in the opening of the Moonstone. Um, but in his drama, Black and White, where, where even though abolition's actually already taken place in 1865, he's criticising the British colonial system. So he was actually far more outspoken about those kind of injustices. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean Dickens famously... Sorry. sorry. Dickens famously um, sort of uh, advocated the what the the what happened in the Indian Mutiny, but Wilkie was um, what what um, the sort of repression of the, the Indians in the um, Indian Mutiny. But Wilkie took a sort of different um, perspective, and uh, he was um, I mean he'd actually written. Uh, Sort of what almost might be called anti-colonialist tracts. He'd written something. I mean, one of his in his journalistic days, he'd written a sermon for sepoys, and uh, this was a, an article um, about how Indians didn't need missionaries. Um, you know, he didn't like that sort of colonial uh, um, activity. And you know, when we come on uh, to the Moonstone. Um, the, the sort of premise of that is that the, the diamond at the center of the story has been appropriated unlawfully. Uh, and this is something that, you know, throughout the, the beginning of the novel anyway, is sort of um, something that, uh, that Wilkie uh, makes clear that he, he disapproves of, i.e., you know, it, it, it was not um, uh, a sort of um, a happy, uh, event. It was not a, you know, it, it wasn't um, uh, something that had been done um, with. It was it was a cursed event. I mean, and actually, as was said at the beginning of the of the novel, that um, you know this was the um, the perpetrator was go was going to be cursed. And this is the the theme throughout. And there's always these these sort of Indian Brahmins sort of hovering around in the background, uh, who eventually uh, get um, you know. Having been suspected of stealing the diamond, uh, the moonstone, they they get it back through a typ typically sort of Wilkie uh, convoluted plot, 
uh, and um, you know they they take it back to India. Um, you know, and he, uh, he was the, very good the, about. I mean, he he understood why, and he also seemed to me to believe that it was quite right they had taken it back. And indeed, the when it was stolen by the uh, the, the soldier at the start, that he murdered an Indian who was guarding it. So it was a horrible, horrible event, and Wilkie depicted it very much so. Uh, and Caroline, how how was his approach to? Um, people of different races and different beliefs in the plays. Well, mainly you you can see this in in black and white, which he wrote in collaboration with Charles Fechter. Um, Fechter, he was he was a Anglo French actor who who emigrated to America, um, and he was great friends with Dickens. Um, that he acted in No Thorough which Dickens and Collins collaborated on and they they were both um you know stunned by his performances which again were very naturalistic they're very realistic and very moving so he came from a kind of line of of actors who who um sought an emotional truth in the way that Dickens did as well and his friend McCready um, but but Fechter had been um, really criticised for his portrayal of Othello just before Black and White um, because he'd chosen to play him as a very pale-skinned Othello um, in the way that Edmund Keane had done. So there was already this kind of ambiguity about race attached to Fechter. And he was also subject to a lot of racism himself because he had a French accent on stage. And so people would really criticise the fact that, you know, although he was this great actor, he he still sounded French. Um, so I think between them, they were coming from this kind of understanding and sim sympathy for race. Um, unfortunately, black and white still um, kind of adheres to some of the conventions of Victorian, what I call the kind of logic of racial melodrama, which is to stereotype the black characters as, you know, minstrelsy in the way that Uncle Tom's cabin, you know, also did the same thing, or, or Dion Boussico in the Octoroon. Um, so he can't quite escape those kind of legacies from the Victorian stage, um, but he's certainly trying. And a lot of my research shown that he came from a, a history of abolitionists, from a family of abolitionists. Um, Caroline, so can I was ask a question really here? dedicated to this. Paul, could I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, I mean, is it? Am I right in thinking that um, Wilkie basically admired French drama more than British drama? Is Absolutely, that... yes. <laughs> Part of that was because um, Dickens and um, Collins knew French actors like Le Maitre and Fechter and Renier who um, studied technique more. They already had very famous schools of acting. They were far more professional than a lot of the British theatres. Um, but they also perceived French drama to have fewer restrictions in the way of um, censorship. And, and Wilkie often talked about that, saying, you know, if I had been a French man, I would have been able to adapt all of my novels. But I'm really restricted by the licensing laws and by the copyright laws. Yes, I mean he he was he, he was he did feel constrained by that, and I, I, there's a piece there's something he wrote to himself in the margins of a book about um, in a Dickens biography, uh, and he said that uh, of the person who'd written it, John Forster, that you know he was trying to say that you couldn't write about what he called the sexual relations that swarm about us. And that's a very unusual phrase for a Victorian writer to use. He certainly didn't use it in any of his books, but he did write about that kind of thing. You mentioned um, uh, disabled people and the, the, the man Miserimus Dexter, who was half man, half chair. He was in a wheelchair, He'd always been in a wheelchair. And yet it was he that Collins chose to make uh, certainly a sexual advance and possibly a sexual attack on Valeria in The Law and the Lady. And in fact, that bit was cut out of the printed version until Wilkie insisted it went back. And it's very interesting that he should choose that disabled character 
to be the person who did make this this sexual advance on on the young heroine in the book. Um, and he also wrote about other disabled people in very positive ways. Um, uh, Blind Love, for example, is is um, sorry, Poor Miss Finch, I should say, not Blind Love. Poor Miss Finch is about a a, a blind woman who falls in love with someone and knows him by his touch. Is, is that a book you've looked at, Caroline? Yes, and also um, Hide and Seek as well, which which he didn't dramatize. But um, Mary yes, Grace uh, yeah. starts off as circus performer, falls off her horse and becomes deaf and mute. Mm. Um, and she's portrayed in a really sympathetic, very, um, very moving way within the novel. And actually, that coincided with Hard Times, didn't it? Which um, also included circus performers. So he often aligned this kind of alterity with theatre um, because actors and theatre were was perceived as kind of others and perceived as on the margins of society. So I think that's part of the attraction, really. Yes, and, and can I just remind everyone listening, and, and thank you all for being here and listening, we've got about 15 minutes of the discussion left, but then we have 15 minutes for your questions, and I'm I'm just waiting now in, in anticipation for your questions, or indeed comments. I mean, if you think we're wrong, if you think, if you've got different points of view, if you want to talk about other things to do with Wilkie Collins, just join in with your questions, and I shall see them on my screen, and we'll be dealing with them after after eight o'clock. Then Andrew Lysett, one of the things that you found in your book was, uh, it wasn't just about Colin's friendship with Dickens, but also his other friendships. He he did have a lot of very close friends, many of whom died during his life. He outlived them. Then he formed new friendships. What did you, how did you feel about him as somebody uh, who would be your friend? <laughs> he was a, I think, it's, it's sort of, he was a, a great friend. He had lots of friends, but he was kind of a kind of a difficult friend in some ways because um, something we haven't actually mentioned, have we? That um, no, he was he was he was um, somebody who was ill most of his life. Um, you know, he had disabilities himself. Um, he he, I mean, had visual deficiencies and had gout i mean his that was his main kind of um, uh symptom if you like and for this he he took um uh copious amounts of um laudanum laudanum you know a tincture of opium as often he would be invited to dinners by his various friends now i'll sort of go into some of them in a moment but he would sort of decline because he he said he was ill or something, he couldn't go. It's, uh, um, so he wasn't the easiest friend to have. But nevertheless, he was somebody who was witty and good company. And um, he was generous. He was generous. I mean, if, if you came around to dinner with him, and perhaps you might even meet his his um, his uh, wife, his girlfriend, um, Caroline, uh, you know, there would be copious uh, lots of um, bottles of wine that um, he had 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 bought. Uh, so, but actual people that he had he was friendly with. Well, to go back to his sort of earlier days, he was very friendly with some of the the sort of artists that surrounded his father in the early in the early days. And so there was particularly a couple of brothers, um, the Ward brothers, um, who I've actually referred to. Uh, in one way or another. Um, Charles Ward, um, was one of the brothers, um, became his banker and so was sort of at Coots and consequently was very much in his in his life. Um, but Wilkie sort of pushed out pushed out the boundaries, if you like. He wasn't he wasn't a sort of conventional man in any way. So he had a he, he was we've talked about his you know interest in French drama and you know he he was a cosmopolitan he had friends uh well European friends I mean you mentioned Charles Fector the actor who was a friend um but also uh friends that um were sort of um uh 
artists from I mean he actually what one of his best friends um grew out of a friendship with uh, a woman called um Nina Chambers who he'd met early on in, in his career she was the daughter of an Edinburgh publisher um uh called Robert Chambers who was well known as sort of encyclopedist polymath um she Wilkie came across her uh touring I think it was with um with Dickens in early days of um when he was uh touring uh with with Dickens on on various um uh plays he met um Nina Chambers she married a man called Frederick Lehman who was a, a very uh, established businessman um of Jewish Jewish origin uh, they became great friends uh the Lehmans were Wilkie's sort of close you can always say closest friends he was always going around to their their house in Highgate where he was he was always very, very welcome and he was introduced to a lot of their cosmopolitan friends um there was a lot of uh, friends in the music business um uh layman's let's get this right um uh his grandfather had been a, a sort of significant music publisher in berlin and he had published beethoven and mendelssohn and some of the um uh um musicians from um from europe when they came to 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 London, they they would they would come through um, the Laymans, and and Wilkie would get to meet them. People like Clara Schulman, Schumann, for example, that you know became a friend of his. Yes, I mean Wilkie had a, a a sort of relationship with Nina Layman right through his life, didn't he? I mean, before she was married, he wrote her a very saucy poem where he said, "I waited like Adam by like Adam by Eve to be tempted." And I, but more fitted than he with the woman to grapple, I return her in toffee, my bite of the apple. That was before she was married. And after she was married, he, he wrote another long verse ending, um, when sober, I can pause and doubt. When not, I can't resist you. I mean, this was to a woman who'd been married 16 years and had children with her husband. So he was, he was very flirtatious with her right through her life, despite the fact that... Um, uh, well, we don't know what their relationship was early in their life, but certainly he remained friends with her for the whole of his life and wrote wrote her very long and detailed letters, almost as long and detailed as those he wrote to um, to his mother and his brother, that they were really great friends. And as you say, Lehman himself was Jewish and he had he had good relationships with several Jewish people, um, which was unusual at the time in the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, other Jewish um, friends that he had. One was um, uh, the, gosh, I've forgotten his name now, Salmons. The, he was the, the um, Lord Mayor of London. Um, another of his Jewish friends was the first Jewish barrister in, in Britain. And um, so these, these were people that um, you know, will be saw fairly regularly. Yes. And of course, when he went to dinner parties, you mentioned going to see these friends at dinner parties, he hated dressing, didn't he? Because, of course, then everybody had to wear their formal clothes if they went to a, a dinner party, even at a friend's house. And when he invited people round, he always put in his letters, no dress, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. He wanted people to sort of come as they were and not dress up like um, like penguins, as, as he saw it. Um, and Yeah, I mean, basically, he was, Caroline, I mean, Caroline, you could say us... this is the the kind of crux of his writing almost you know he was he was there to to kind of break down uh traditional barriers to um get rid of the fusty old things and um you know to to become natural that was what he was he was trying to do but he did it in a very uh very um very idios idiosyncratic it's not quite the right word but you know he he was part part of that genre if you want to go back to that sensation fiction um and you know he was trying to to show um new ways of re of relating um and um and i suppose we haven't have we have we discussed um the woman in white enough 
<laughs> we haven't really discussed it very much. No, it, it, it's uh, tell us a bit more about the woman in white and how important it was. We have five minutes left of the discussion and we have got questions coming in. Thank you for those. And please send some more. But yes, the woman in white, his most famous book, the one he wanted and indeed had put on his gravestone, author of the woman in white and other works of fiction. In fact, he wrote 30 novels, 60 odd short stories. And as we've been discussing, uh, 18 plays, I think, Carol, I may be one or two more or less, I'm not sure. But just briefly, The Woman in White. Andrew, why was it so important? Well, because um, it was a, a wonderful story. It was really, you know, the, the his, I mean, I mentioned one or two other novels that he'd written earlier, but this was, this was when he sort of, you know, kind of really established himself as the, the master of the um, sensation novel. And, and, and the master of taken the up by novel. other sensation novelists of, of that age, like um, uh, uh, Mary Braddon, um, and, and you know they they kind of uh, they 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 paid obeisance to the woman in white. Um, it, it was a story. I, I, we've actually did mention you know how um, the uh, the woman in white sort of emerged and might have been Caroline Graves. It wasn't. Um, it was somebody who apparently had uh, a woman who escaped from a private asylum uh, and um, you know sort of perhaps I'll leave it to Caroline to kind of uh, fill in some of the background of the story and maybe you you will as well Paul but um, you know what interests me particularly was this aspect of um, of Wilkie's personal life that he was he was right he was as a there was a sort of journalist in him he the in the 1850s, late 1850s, there was something, um, uh, I think they, they call it the lunacy panic. And uh, um, suddenly the practice of locking people into private asylums was, was, was sort of part of the, the, the sort of political agenda almost. And, and Wilkie alighted on this. Um, he knew several people in in the field of, um, of of private asylums, and you know was able to feed in some of his um, some of his knowledge. Uh, only the year before uh, the Woman in White was was written, um, there had been um, a, a sort of a, a public furore about the committal of um, Rosina Bulwer Lytton. Uh, to an asylum, um, and she'd um, she'd been put in, you know, committed by her husband because he. Yes, it it was a way that husbands got, got rid elections. of wives that they wanted to get rid of, wasn't it? And um, we're coming to the end, Andrew. So so let me interrupt you That's there and, right. and ask yeah. ask Caroline, uh, what was the significance of the woman in white to you? Um. I think at the time, I was very young when I read it, and it was just a cracking good story, wasn't yes. it, with amazing... I mean, Collins is often criticised for not having strong characterization. I totally disagree with that. I, I think the the um, character of Marion Halcombe and Fosco and Fosco's wife and you know they they for me they sit aside Dickens' greatest characters. They're they're so clear in my mind. Um, and I think since then, knowing more about Victorian literature and Victorian theatre. Um, it fits very neatly in some of the conventions like the use of the double, the um, lunatic asylum that you were talking about, Andrew. You, you know, I can see it as a collection of a very topical but sensational tropes, um, you, you know, which just just more and more things are revealed by, by them. Yes, yes. And... Um... We've got just just very briefly then, can I ask you, uh, Andrew first, and I mean in 30 seconds, why is Wilkie Collins so important? What's the one thing you'd leave people with? He's a very modern writer and he addressed it, addressed issues in, as we have kind of explained, we have, we've tried to, to look into, um, you know, he addressed issues of um, modern sort of psychological 
political issues in in a modern way that um, still stands up. And and Caroline, and so seconds. whereas some Victorian writers uh, have been sort of relegated, um, Wilkie Collins is still of great interest um, in you know across Thank the board you, in, in the academy, and he's he's he's, he's widely read as well. Caroline, well, for me. He wasn't a failed dramatist. He was an important dramatist. A lot of people recognised him as that. And um, I hope to salvage his reputation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we move on to the questions now. We've got we've got a f 15 minutes and we've got a few questions coming in, quite a lot, actually. And let me start with you, Caroline, because Mark has, has sent us a message um, to discuss his, his impact on the detective story um, and how he impacted that that genre is that something that you you know your work with the plays has helped with um well certainly the moonstone reflected the the detective strand of the novel um i wouldn't say it's very apparent in the other dramas but pro probably andrew can talk more about the moonstone's role in de detective fiction although he'd actually written an earlier short story didn't he and and rodway um, yes. the female yes, that, that, detective. Was, she yes. was the first female detective, I think, and he also had the first dog detective, I believe. Um, Andrew, oh. what is his importance in detective fiction? Oh, um, well, um, he he created the modern detective, really. I mean, it's sort of um, in Sergeant Cuff in the Moonstone. He is a, a detective who goes into, into the house. Now, this was something that um, was a sort of novelty. This was a part of a feature of, uh, of almost, could almost say it's a feature of, of um, sensation fiction, bringing things into the home. Uh, so Sergeant Cuff goes uh, to um, look into the, um, the disappearance of, of the Moonstone. Um, after the the local constabulary local constable has failed you know he's he's and you know you you get the sense of cuff examining clues um you know the way that the 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 book is presented by from various viewpoints uh so um it was very much a precursor of later detective stories um uh you know people actually funny enough I've, I've written a book about um Conan, well both conan doyle and sherlock holmes and wilkie collins strangely doesn't feature too much in in uh, conan doyle's um sort of the, the the names that he comes up with but he is clearly one of the the people who came up with the the development of the, the detective story, along with Edgar Allan Poe, who is somebody that um, Conan Doyle does pay obeisance to. Um, and he, and, he certainly uh, influenced later writers. So Dorothy Sayers started to write a whole book about Collins um, because she was so influenced by him. And Agatha Christie, I think Ellie Griffiths was talking yesterday in the book club, wasn't she? So so he's, James, I think his legacy is enormous. Yes, P.D. James, of course, was, was yes. a great fan of his and was, in fact, patron of our Wilkie Collins Society until her death. Um, uh, and Caroline, could you say a bit more about his... Um, relationship. Kate Newey has asked this with um, members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and how important that was, because of course his brother was on the fringes of that, wasn't he, with with Millet and well, the other. His his brother was extremely involved with them, and and it was one of the family's um, sadnesses that he wasn't uh, he wasn't taken in as a member of the Brotherhood, but he was Millet's best friend. And he was also very close to Holman Hunt, um, to Charles Alston. Um, but but Collins was was also really close to Holman Hunt and Millet. Um, and I don't think you can underestimate the importance because for me, the the type of realism that the pre-Raphaelites sought in their art was the type of realism that that Collins was trying to recreate, certainly in the dramas. Um, so, uh, and also it, it kind of puts into context his personal life. 
um, because it was very, I mean, all the things that you've both been talking about were quite normal for artists and for bohemians and pre-Raphaelites. Um, Victorians weren't all these middle class, you know, very religious people. They 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 certainly broke with convention. Um, and, and so his circle um, was was very much a, a progressive and liberal circle. Have, have we mentioned the fact that um, uh, Wilkie's brother, Charlie, was was a sort of fringe pre-Raphaelite? Well, I think you did say that. But but then the sort of circle was um, uh, was made because um, Charlie married Dickens's daughter, Katie. Yes. Um, in what was sort of... Yes, and Dickens wasn't, marriage, but, uh, wasn't happy about that. And she was an interesting character in her own right. Yes. I, I mean, it may not have been a successful marriage, not least because, of course, she um, he died of, of um, stomach cancer and spent about took about three years dying. And people may not know that within a few months of Charles's death, she married the artist um, Perugini um, secretly in the register office. And then a year later, with no one present from the family, and then a year later, she and Carlo Perugini married again in church with all the family present, where official marriage. But they actually married within oh, months right. of Charles Collins dying, um, which was, and there are two marriage certificates. I've never known anybody who had two genuine marriage certificates without a divorce in between. Um, and so she was probably having an affair with Carlo Perugini while Charles was 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 sickening. That, of course, was long after Dickens' death in 1870. Um, but certainly Dickens did seem to get a bit fed up with, with Charles' constant illness. So he did give him a lot of work. He wrote a lot of things for all the year round. And, of course, was the designer of um, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, the cover for the parts of The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And then he had to not, not do any more work on the book because um, of his illness, which... Uh, sadly took him in uh, the middle of 1873, as I recall. Um, and yeah, there were some of Wilkie's friends were much more bohemian than him. I mean, one of his friends, the artist Frith, had, had, had a wife with whom he had 10 children and a mistress living down the road with whom he had another eight, I think. So, you know, Wilkie, having, having two women was not that unusual in all of Wilkie's circle. Can um, I say something another, on another that, thing. Paul, please? Sorry, Andrew. Can I, Paul? Yeah. I, I just wanted to say something about that because... Um, one of the Wilkie's sort of interests uh, was polygamy. Um, and that sort of um, grew out of uh, uh, a, a case um, that he got to know about sort of back in the 1840s, actually, almost before he really sort of started going. But um, a woman had been... Uh, um, put into, well, had, had spent time with her sisters in uh, a religious uh, group called the Abode of Love, Ag Agapemony was known as, and, and she was um, spirited out of that, kidnapped out of that by a, a member of her family, and um, uh, was put in an asylum where she appealed to a friend of Wilkie's called Brian Proctor, um, who you know crops up a friend of Dickens as well, who crops up throughout the um, the, uh, the the sort of bulky story, but the the abode of love was um, this uh, this polyamorous religious group, uh, which um, a friend of Wilkie's called uh, William Hepworth Dixon wrote about uh, in a book of his called Spiritual Wives, which came out in 19, in eighteen sixty eight, just at the the same time as, as, as the Moonstone. Um, and when Wilkie went to uh, the United States a few years later, um, just in the, in the 1874, I think it was, uh, that it, um, he made, he wanted to actually sort of explore this matter of um, polygamy. He wanted to go and uh, visit um, the, the Mormons in, in, um, in Utah, but he just, he, found that the sort of railway journey was too long. So he actually went to um, a polygamous community in Connecticut uh, that um, sort of welcomed him. I mean, he, he sort of saw it not just as polygamy, but it sort of almost, they, they thought as a sort of almost communist um, thing, which I think was putting it a bit too, too high. 
but he, he, he was obviously interested in that sort of community where everybody, um, you know, were, you know, loving each other. And, um, you know, he, he came back to uh, um, uh, uh, examples of that in, in, his, in his writing. You know, there, there were yeah. sort of yes. figures I mean... who had been in religious communities and that sort of thing. We've had a question about why he was critical of the institution of marriage, which he certainly was. And of course, he he had these two um, uh, lovers, and he didn't marry either of them. Though Martha Rudd, the the, the young woman who you mentioned, the um, daughter of a of a shepherd, um, she did say after, long after he was dead that she could have married him at any time. Whether that's true, of course, we'll never know. But um, do we know why he was critical of marriage? Did did it? come over to you anywhere, Andrew, in your work? Um, yes, I think <laughs> it was it was um it was something to do with Wilkie's character. Um he now uh I did write write down <laughs> I can't find um uh something that he he wrote early in his journalistic career about being a bachelor. Do you remember the title of that? Um Okay, it doesn't really matter. But anyway, he'd written about this and he he said well, that... There was The Bachelor he, Bedroom, which he wrote when... Um, uh, uh, objected house, to marriage when because it took men from um, sort of male friendships. Uh, and, you know, there, there was nothing kind of... This was just Wilkie saying... Um, there's nothing homoerotic about this, as far as I can make out. That, you know, it was just Wilkie saying that, you know, he he liked going to the club with, you know, he, he became a member of the Athenaeum Club. He liked going to, to Paris with Dickens. He liked going on sailing trips with his friend Smith Piggott, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And, you know, Matt, he, this article that he wrote was about how having children and being married sort of got in the way of that. Yes. I, th I think you have to balance that with some of the works that he wrote, for instance, um, Man and Wife, and also the, I think it's the evil genius where he really advocates for women's right to keep their children, women's right to be released from bad marriages. You, you know, he, he could also be a great advocate for, for women because they got a really rough deal in the 19th century. Um, and particularly about property and children. And, and so, Yes, there is that side of him which we can view as as homo sociability, which was very, very much an aspect of Victorian male culture. But but there is also a feminist streak to him, which we mustn't forget. Yes, um, uh, we've had another question, which is absolutely one for you, Caroline. I'd like to try and squeeze it in. Um, Claire writes about his adaptations of Collins to TV and film and how do you rate them? But she finishes by saying, is there a novel you would like to see dramatised over the Moonstone and the Woman of White, which are often adapted for TV? Absolutely. I would love to see No Name. I met a director who was working on it once and I've been waiting for it ever since. <laughs> Haven't yet seen it. And Armadale, I think, would make a fantastic adaptation. I've tried on numerous occasions to get the BBC to take the lighthouse, and it's got through to the final rounds each time, and then and then failed. <laughs> say it's quite so a they're short going play. to and a, and the, a real melodrama, isn't it? I would call it a melodrama yeah. anyway. They will stick to the Moonstone and the Women in White, which are fantastic. But wouldn't it be great to see some of the other novels? Yes, it, it would indeed. And in fact, the, the Woman in White is being, or a radio adaptation of it, is being broadcast on Radio 4 Extra. I think the first one was today. And you can see that, or you can hear that, I should say, on BBC Sounds. Uh, Andrew, is that too obscure a question for you now? Which novel would you like to see dramatised, apart from The Moonstone and The Woman in White? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you said no name, did, Caroline, is that right? Caroline said no name, yes. Oh, well, that's what I what I would go to. But I mean, I suppose, you know, I'd also like to see Basil um, mm. dramatised because I think, you know, it could be a wonderful, moody piece about um, but London. There was quite a good, there there was was a quite a good film of Basil. Um, yeah. uh, uh, 1850s. 
um, you know, the sort of growth of suburbia. Yes. I I'm sorry, but the um, the Radio 4 producer that always lives in my oh, head, okay. uh, we <laughs> have run out of time. So that really is it. Thanks for the questions. And I apologise to those of you who sent questions that we couldn't answer. I, I actually got a copy of them and I will see if I can answer some of you offline. Uh, my thanks to all of you, of course, for listening to this conversation about Wilkie Collins on his 200th birthday. Thanks to B. Rolat at the British Library, which got us on air despite its recent cyber attack. And my thanks, of course, to Andrew Lysett and Caroline Radcliffe for a fascinating discussion. And of course, thanks to that Victorian superstar, 200 today, Wilkie Collins. <laughs>